Hello and welcome to Numerous to Call. We're continuing our series on building a baseball prediction model. In this video, we are going to analyze the odds data that we collected last time. So last time, if you'll remember, we talked about how odds work, how betting works in Las Vegas, and then we showed how to go online and get some historical odds data and how to convert those into probabilities that represent what was Vegas's predicted probability for each of those games. In this video, we're going to now take those odds numbers and look at our last model and see how well is our very simple first model doing with respect to the, the Las Vegas predicted probabilities. So uh, if you haven't done so already, please, if you could uh, like and subscribe to the channel, that would be great. It really help me out a lot. Also, as a reminder, the notebook for this lesson will be uh, available in the description. The link will be in the description, so please check that out if you want to follow along. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into the notebook. Okay, so in the last notebook and in the last lesson, we obtained historical odds data from oddshark.com. We showed how to grab those tables off the, off the web. And then we ran through our game level data and pulled out the implied probabilities for each of the teams. We also pulled the over under lines that we'll use at some point down the road. And we saved that data to a file. We gave it this name, DFBP3. And now in this notebook, we're gonna explore this odds data and uh, also compare the quality of our first model's predictions to the implied probabilities given by the Las Vegas odds makers. So let's get started. So we'll run through the first couple cells, which load in our, our uh, data. And if we do a df.info and scroll all the way down, we see some of the new columns we added. So the implied probability for the home team, the implied probability for the visiting team, uh, the midpoint, which we'll explain in a minute. Then we'll also show the over underline. So the, if you remember, the over underline is the number where Vegas is setting about even money that the total number of runs will be either above or below this value and then the over-under result for that game. So again, whenever I add a new data, I like to just do a couple sanity checks, just make sure everything worked as I expected. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to confirm that when the implied probability for the home team is zero, that we are in one of the seasons before 2019. So we only had odds data for 2019 through 2022. And so anything before 2019, we're not going to have uh, any, any implied probabilities. So we had set them all to zero. And I just want to make sure we don't have any zeros in this, the, the four years, 2019 through 2022. So the way I'm going to do this is uh, to use this crosstab function. And this just makes a two-way table. Whenever the probability is bigger than zero, we have uh, true. And whenever it's equal to zero in this case, we'll have false. So you can see we don't have odds for 1980 all the way through 2018, which we expect, but the thing I really want to check is these numbers. So for 2019 through 2022, we always have a probability bigger than zero. So we, for all the games in our data set, we have all the odds numbers for 2019 through 2022. So for this exploration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just pick out the seasons from 2019 to 2022. These are the seasons where we have valid odds numbers. And so this way we can work with this particular data set. Okay. And let's look at uh, five rows of this data set. So the thing I wanted to point out was let's look at our implied probabilities all the way over here. So let's look at this game. So in this game, the implied probability for the home team was 60%. So this meant they had a line of minus 150, if you remember from our previous lesson. But um, so that means if you bet on the home team, you have to bet on them as if they were going to win 60% of the time. But then notice if you're going to bet on the visiting team, you're going to bet on them if they're going to win 42.5% of the time. Now, since either the home team wins or the visiting team wins, that means that when you're betting on the visiting team, they're saying that the probability that the home team is going to win is actually only 57.5%. So 
So when you bet one way, they say the team's going to win 60% of the time. When you bet another way, they say it's going to win 57.5% of the time. And this is because of the, the vigorous, as we spoke about in the last lesson. Vegas takes a little bit of an edge so that their probabilities of the two teams are going to add up to more than one. So if we want to know what does Vegas really think the probability of the game is, a good, a good approximation is the midpoint. So what we're going to do for this implied probability H mid is we take the midpoint between 60% and 1 minus this value. So these are two different kind of estimates of the probability. And we assume Vegas really really thinks the answer is right in the middle, and they're taking a little bit of spread on each side so that they can make some money. So these are the probabilities that we're going to use to evaluate the quality of Las Vegas predictions, and we'll compare these probabilities to our predicted probabilities from our models to see who's doing better, relatively speaking. So let's look at the, the Las Vegas odds uh, over this span, so for these, these four seasons of data that we have. And uh, if you look at this histogram, you see that you get a lot more spread than we had from our model. And we'll, we'll revisit our model uh, shortly. But you can see, you know, there are some games where they, there's quite a few games where they're predicting that the home team's gonna win 70% of the time or more. And, you know, quite a few, even less than 30%. And between 30 and 40%, you still got a big amount. And 16, 70%, you got a big amount. So this model is kind of more confident. It's able to make more predictions that are closer to zero and one. Now remember, the most naive model would just be a bar at like 53.8%, right? Where you just say, I don't know anything about this game. I'm just going to guess 53.8% for everything because uh, I don't know anything else. So if you think about it, the, the, the most naive model would be a thin bar right in the middle. As you get a little better, you get a little bit of spread around that number. Then you get more spread as the model gets more confident. A supremely confident model would have a bar at zero and a bar at one. And say, I know the answer every time, right? Now, we, we don't expect to get that far. But that's the way you should think of this continuum. So you're going from a bar in the middle to sort of some, some spread around it, increasing spread around it. And then if you were able, if you were in a problem where it was actually possible to, to be very certain, you'd start getting all your mass at zero and one. So the way to think about this is we're going to compare this histogram later to the histogram of scores we get from our, our sort of simple model that just used the team batting statistics. Now, the other thing I want to look at is what if I add the two probabilities? Now, remember we said that these Las Vegas implied probabilities are going to add up to more than one. So if we do a histogram here, it's interesting to analyze. So you see, you get... Most of the time, the probabilities add up to somewhere between 1.01 and 1.03, and averaging around 2%. So Vegas is kind of on average, looks like they're taking about a 2% edge. But then we also have some games over here on the right side of the, the histogram, where we've got another sort of bulge around 4% between kind of 103 and 105. And this is not as many, but this shows that sometimes, for some games, Vegas is taking a bigger spread. And I don't know exactly what, where this comes from, but I suspect it has to do with, for some games, they're going to, they maybe have less clarity over who, you know, what the probability is. And if they have less clarity, they're going to increase the spread to cover themselves a little bit more. So if they really feel like, hey, I've got the probability nailed, I'm very, very sure it's, 62 percent then they could give a smaller percent smaller spread around it if they really don't know and they're like geez this could be 50 percent this could be 60 percent they might put 55 and then put a bigger spread around it to cover themselves a little more in case they're not assessing the situation correctly so this is really interesting because it shows you you know how vegas is making its money and you know it, it would be interesting to dig in more and explore what's different about these games that have a higher higher spread than the ones that have an hour spread. But what I really want to do in this video is uh, resurrect our model from the second 
lesson where we built a very simple model based on team batting statistics and compare it to the, to the Las Vegas probabilities. So this is exactly the same code that we ran previously. Uh, again, I'm just going to use on-base percentage and slugging percentage on a team level, averaged over the last 162 games. And uh, I'm going to build my model again using LightGBM. Let me put the max up to three. Get our predictions. Now, again, we're going to compare the loss of this model, so I call the LGBM loss, to the naive loss. The naive loss is where you just use the, the mean for everything. So let's compare those two values. So remember, the naive loss was 0.69. And remember, that should be thought of as kind of our starting point. This is where we're starting. This is the amount of uncertainty we have when we start. And then as we build a model that, that uses more and more features and gets more and more clarity about the situations of each game, that number should go down. So with our simple model, we're able to bring that number down from 690 to 682. So. Let's now evaluate what does what can Las Vegas do? How much have they brought down their uncertainty? And if we compare that, we see they've got it down to 0.667. So they've done a considerably better job in their probabilities than our very simple model. And this makes sense. We wouldn't expect a model that just looked at team hitting, didn't look at the pitching at all, didn't uh, you know, didn't factor in lots of aspects of the game that presumably the Vegas bookmakers are factoring in. We it would be surprising if our model was doing better than the odds. It would be very, very surprising. But what this gives us is a, a way to sort of quantify where we are on the spectrum between if you've got the very naive model here where you just don't know anything and you're just saying 53% all the time, and then you've got the Las Vegas, which is presumably a, a very good model's probability. Where are we on that spectrum? Are we almost to the Vegas? Are we really close to the naive? Where are we? So a simple way to do this is to just say from 6904 to 6674, where do we sit? So I just do a simple ratio. And this says we're about 33% of the way from if zero is the naive model and one is the Las Vegas model, we're about a third of the way there. So we've, we've gotten about a third of the way from naive model to the Las Vegas probabilities. Just using, again, four very simple features um, that are just team hitting based. So that, that seems to make sense. That seems reasonable. Next, I want to look at the calibration of the Las Vegas probabilities. So the idea here is to say when Las Vegas says 67% and we look at all the games where they predicted 67%, is, is, is it, does it actually end up being 67% of the time? So the way to do this is we'll, we'll make bins. We're going to make bins between 50 and 55, 55 and 60 and so forth. Bins are with 0.05 and uh, see what the empirical probability was compared to the predicted probability. So here you see this is the this is the reliability diagram. Each of these dots represents the empirical probability for all the predictions that were in a particular bin. Now if the dots fall exactly on the line then that's very strong evidence that it's perfectly calibrated. But again, we wouldn't expect it to be perfectly calibrated. Just like when you flip a thousand coins, you're not going to get exactly 500. So the error bars represent what's a 95% confidence interval on where we would expect the predicted probabilities to land. And so you see almost all the dots are within the predicted probability. We've got one outlier here. And, uh, 
but but I wouldn't read too much into this one because it could be it could be that hey they're they're under predicting so it looks like this bin is when they predict between 65 and 70 percent the actual probability was a bit higher it looks like it was you know maybe about 75 percent um, so that's interesting but then again that also could just be random noise because remember if you think about it each of these bars were saying there's a 95% chance, if it was perfectly calibrated, there'd be a 95% chance for each one that it's in the range. That means there's a 5% chance that it would be outside of the range. So you'd expect on average one in 20, even if the thing is perfectly calibrated, one time in 20, we're gonna get a dot outside the range. And if you look at this, we've already got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we've done 13 of these and we got one outside the range. So that's not that surprising since we would expect one in 20. So I wouldn't read that much into it. But, you know, if you have some other reason to think, hey, this is signal that might warrant diving in and investigating further. On the right hand side, we, we have how many predictions they made in each of these ranges. And you can see that the higher the bar is on the right, the narrower the corresponding confidence interval is. And the, the extreme left and the extreme right have very few observations, so the confidence bar is very wide. But overall, my takeaway from this is that the probabilities seem to be pretty well calibrated. Might be worth it we, if we come across something later on that's, that might explain why this one seems to be a little bit miscalibrated. Uh, this one bar between 0.65 and 0.70, we might go back and investigate that. But for now, I would say this seems like they're doing a pretty good job of calibrating their probabilities. Next, I want to analyze the discrepancies. So let's compare the places where our model has a very big different, a very different prediction than the Vegas odds makers. So where is it that our model makes one prediction and the Vegas model makes a very different prediction? And this is a good way to, uh, to do what I would call failure analysis of your model. If you have a model that you know is very good, but, and you're trying to improve your model to reach that, one thing to do is to say, where did my model differ from that model? And look at those, look at those situations and say, what, what is this model seeing, this good model, that my sort of simple model is not seen. And then you could engineer some features or get some more data or do something to try to address that in your model so that your model is taking advantage of that information that the other model is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'm gonna define a variable called test disk, which is the absolute value of the difference. So it's just like, what's the distance between my prediction and the Vegas prediction, the simple model prediction and the Vegas prediction. And let's do a histogram of that. So you see, typically, typically they're close, but you've got this tail, and uh, there's some places where the discrepancy is quite big. So I'm going to go to the very end of this tail. I'm going to just look at where it's uh, 0.25 or greater, and let's just look at these cases. And specifically, if you look through these. You know, lots of things to look at, but I want to look at the, the pitchers because we know that pitching is a huge part of baseball and we're not doing anything with pitching. And if you start looking through, you might see some, some names that you recognize of, of very strong pitchers. So Garrett Cole, uh, Yu Darvish, um, Jacob deGrom. So let, let's dive in a little more. Let, let's look at in this small sample, I'm going to take out, so I wrote a kind of a fancy list comprehension, but all this says is um, if the home team was favored in this game, get the home, the home team pitcher. If not, give me the visiting team pitcher. So which pitcher was favored in these games where it, there was a big discrepancy between the Las Vegas model and my model? Who, who was the pitcher of the favored team, the Las Vegas favored team? And you'll see these are all generally strong pitchers, 
right? You've got Jacob de Gram here three times, you Darvish is here twice. These are generally very, very strong pitchers. And if you look at the underdogs in these games, you'll see again some names pop up, Annabelle Sanchez, Corey Abbott. And if you look these pitchers up, you'll see these are pitchers who, at least at the time of this data set, which is mostly around, you know, between 2019 and 2022, these were pitchers who were, were not highly regarded at the time. So it makes sense that the biggest discrepancy between the simple model, which just looked at some basic team hitting statistics and the Las Vegas probabilities has to do with the starting pitchers. And that discrepancy was widest when you had a really good starting pitcher for one team against a very low quality pitcher for the other team. So this all makes sense. This is kind of what you would expect if you think about it, but it's good to look in the data and see that this really plays out. This gives you confidence that you're on the right track, that you've done things correctly. So now the next thing I want to check though is for these cases where the Las Vegas model disagreed strongly or had a big discrepancy between the simple hitting model. Just wanted to confirm that Las Vegas was sort of right, that, that their, their answers were right. Because they're giving a probability, we're giving a probability. Do we, do we know that maybe our model was better in those cases? Who knows? I mean, our models certainly seem to be worse overall. But maybe for these cases, maybe it did okay. So let, let's confirm just that, that the Las Vegas model actually did better in these cases. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to do another two-way table. And again, I'm going to look at just, just the cases where this discrepancy is bigger than 0.2. So I, I lowered the threshold. Now we're looking at bigger than 0.2 before we're looking at bigger than 0.25. So I'm going to get a few more games so that we have a bigger sample. And I'm going to look at what was the Las Vegas probability rounded to two decimal, rounded to one decimal place? And did the home team win or not? So we see that when the, when the probability, Vegas gave a probability of around 0.7 or 0.8, we see that overall, again, small sample size, but combining those two, where the, the home team was strongly favored, the home team won 18 times and lost eight times. And if you look at the other cases where the home team is a big underdog, so around 0.3, some 0.2, some 0.4, we see that indeed uh, the home, the, the, the uh, visiting team was much more likely to win in those cases. So you've got 37 wins for the visiting team and just nine for the other team. So it's about, uh, 75% roughly that the visiting team won. So for this subset of games, it seems like Las Vegas is doing pretty well. When they said it was, when they said the home team was strongly favored, the home team certainly won with a high probability. When they said the visiting team was favored, the visiting team won with a high probability. Now let's compare that to our model. Let's look at what our model said for these same exact games. So you see, first of all, our model it was never very confident, whereas the Vegas thing, the Vegas model gave probabilities either, you know, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, or 0 0.4 or less, you know, generally got probabilities closer to zero or one. Our model was still kind of hedging, like, eh, you know, I don't really know who's gonna win. Um, some it gave about 50%, some it gave about 60%. Again, this is rounded to one decimal place. So this, this 0.5 means it was between 0.45 and 0.55. This 0.6 means it was between 0.55 and 0.65. And you see that where, where our model said 50%, it was 31 versus 16, right? And where our model said it was 60%, actually it was maybe about 60% the other way. Again, small samples. But um, if you had to say which, which model seemed to have better probabilities in this case, and again, this is just sort of a qualitative analysis, but I think the evidence is pretty clear here. When, when, this, the, when the Vegas model gave low probabilities, the, the visiting team won with a quite high probability. When it, when, it gave, when it favored the home team, the home team won with a high probability. And with our model, 
we said it was even and the, the home team usually lost. And when we said it, the home team was slightly favored, they still mostly lost. So what does this mean for what we should do next? Well, our analysis shows that the Las Vegas odds are better than our current model. And the largest discrepancies appear when we have a strong pitcher versus a weak pitcher. And the Las Vegas probably is seem to be right in those cases, they are onto something. So the conclusion is we need to factor in the starting pitcher to improve our model. So how are we gonna do that? What's gonna be our approach? Well, we need to get game level data for each pitcher. And then we can do a similar kind of aggregation that we did at the team for the team level hitting. We can take a picture, we can look, compute some statistics based on their recent performance. And then for every game of pitcher pitches, we can put in as a feature, what was their recent performance? How good a pitcher are they based on their recent performance? And then we can augment our data frame to include those statistics. So just like we had the team bet, uh, team's on-base percentage and team slugging, we could add in starting pitchers, ERA, walks, hits over innings pitch, these types of uh, features for the pitcher that will then hopefully improve our model quite significantly. Then we can build a model with these features and see how well it does. So in the next lesson, we are going to, uh, to show how to scrape this data, which is going to be a little bit more tricky than our previous data acquisition, and, and then how to add it into our model. And then we'll, in, a, in the video after that, we'll actually be able to add that pitching data to our model and see how much closer we can get to the Las Vegas model or even possibly surpass it using the starting pitching data. So I hope you'll join me, join me for that. Again, if you could please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel, it would really help me out a lot. And I hope you'll join me for the next videos in this series. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.